do in relation to the subsidy that they get. And the reason is because the subsidy is given just to anybody who claims to be doing uh, research and development without any mechanism of accountability, without the government sort of checking up on whether the money from the subsidy has been used to do research that the company would not otherwise have done. So um, the bottom line is that research and, and development subsidies across the board, these horizontal policies, generally a bad idea, um, better to do more direct government commissioning, which implies, of course, that you have to have some government agency that has the capacity to do this commissioning, such as DARPA in the United States. The UK does not have any such agency equivalent to DARPA. There's now talk of establishing such an agency, but it hasn't yet got very far. Um, and the final point I'll make is that when innovations are made by publicly financed programs, the state should have a significant royalty claim. And this, this is with reference to um, what has happened in the United States. Um, because um, uh, innovations which are developed in this type two industrial policy, the network industrial policy, have tended to be given to the private sector without um, any significant royalty claim on the part of the laboratories, the public laboratories, where this work was done. And so the state has been handing over um, very expensively generated innovations to the private sector in return for very little. And um, that seems to be quite wrong. Of course, the private companies like this a lot. Um, in the case, for example, of, of one particular cancer drug, Toxel, it was discovered by the National Institutes of Health. It was given to one of the big uh, pharmaceutical, U.S. pharmaceutical companies, which has made billions of dollars of profit from it, but it, it, that company has returned almost no money to the NIH. And that, uh, that seems to me to be a serious flaw in the design of the American industrial policy system. Okay, so um, just uh, the, the final point I'll make. We have this increase in industrial policy going on since the crisis, but actually the basis of knowledge is very thin because of this toxicity that, uh, of the phrase industrial policy. Very few political scientists, very few economists have paid much attention to the subject. So we know actually rather little about what various governments are doing on the ground by way of industrial policy, number one. And number two, we know rather little about how governments try to organize a strategy. That is, we know rather little about how DARPA is organized internally. Nobody's really studied the internal operations of DARPA. Nobody's studied how the Taiwan's Industrial Development Bureau actually operates. So there seems to me to be a real gap here. If you want to do good industrial policy rather than bad industrial policy, you have to have more knowledge about how to actually organize it in a sensible way. So that's the end of my talk. I'd be happy to take um, questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have now some time for questions and answers. Uh, please introduce yourself and uh, uh, take the floor uh, and do our, uh, our Okay. Yeah, hello. Alexander Novaski. Uh, professor, um, you mentioned only briefly uh, location as a, as a factor in industrial policy. Um, you haven't mentioned uh, state uh, level um, policies in the US to promote certain industries uh, by preferential tax treatment or in some way, in some other way, preferential treatment that states uh, give to uh, companies. Uh, a spectacular, if rather, um, I think, um, unsuccessful example uh, has been uh, preferential treatment for uh, film makers in, in various states. And also, uh, special economic zones. Um, in India, I understand there's quite a, 
a serious effort to create uh, clusters uh, through the use of uh, SCZs. Uh, is, you didn't seem to mention it. Is it because it, that it doesn't, in your view, fall in, in within the sphere of industrial policy, or is it because it's bad industrial policy, or you just focus on something else? Thank you. Okay, we take three questions at a time and then Professor uh, Wade would answer. Who is the next? Yes. Uh, my question is connected with uh, your notion, with your uh, um, uh, des describing the Taiwanese example, that the Taiwanese government, but by maintaining a high level of bureaucracy and uh, thus by having uh, many instruments to control the flow of uh, supply, uh, was able to force the company, big company, to change the pattern of supply. Mm -hmm. And in this aspect, I would like to ask you whether for it's beneficial for a country which wants to uh, introduce such a policy to have a, a rich arsenal of instruments like this. I mean, uh, the administrative constraint, which is very difficult in a situation uh, of countries like Poland right now, because we are practically open. So what should we do uh, to uh, somehow persuade, uh, the, um, persuade some changes uh, in order to increase the, uh, the share of domestic uh, manufacturers? Uh, it's over there? Yes. I think one, one question just in terms of outsourcing. Introduce yourself. Not mentioned, uh, Can you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Daniel Spetek, I just said in the beginning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, uh, my, my question is concerning outsourcing. I think I not mentioned. And how do you balance outsourcing? So your, your question is about outsourcing. What? Outsourcing. Yeah, uh -huh. this is just a very popular it's yeah. a, the economic idea uh, for the last years. This is also uh, foreign investment included in, in China or in, in India. So, how just to, to, to implement it? What are you just saying? I have seen that uh, now in the US, the new uh, manufacturing uh, policy is just changing. They are just uh, uh, limiting uh, our sorts. Thank you. OK. Um, just before I begin, I wanted to make one other point about the organization of can, industry. Can you use the mic, please? Before I begin, I wanted to make one more point about the organization of industrial policy. Um, and the point is that uh, the, any such uh, national effort uh, at a coordinated industrial policy must be headed by some ministry other than the finance ministry. Um, on the other hand, the ministry most interested in doing such a thing is the finance ministry. At least the finance ministry tends to be the most powerful ministry and uh, likes to get um, into control of projects of this kind. But um, that is fatal. The industrial policy project has to be put in the hands of something like an industry ministry, possibly even an education ministry, because an industrial policy has very important skill requirements. But um, keep it out of the hands of the finance ministry just in case anybody in this room has any influence over Polish um, industrial policy. Um, <clears throat> in terms of um, the questions, yes, a lot of um, activity does go in, in the US uh, uh, does go on at the state level, not the federal level. I was talking just to save time about the federal level that states have also been active and competing against each other to bring um, higher value-added, uh, higher productivity activities to their states um, and sending trade missions, for example, to induce 
um, uh, foreign firms to locate in their state rather than in some other state. Um, in terms of special economic zones, um, I think in the general case, uh, there is a strong um, effect of proximity on productivity. That is, to put it crudely, proximity, that is, firms co-locating uh, near to each other, such as in Silicon Valley, such as Route 128 around Boston, um, firms locating near to each other uh, does have a, an effect in generating a general rise in productivity. Um, in Silicon Valley, it's possible for an engineer working for one company to drive up the road and sit down with an engineer working for a competitor company but for them to cooperate in finding a solution to common problems. And it's easy because they meet each other after work, because they live close by. So this is just one example of how um, bringing firms together in clusters can lead to a general increase in productivity as compared to not bringing those firms uh, close to each other. This is true even in the age of the internet. Um, on the other hand, uh, in terms of government-sponsored special economic zones, I, I think, and in the context of developing countries, I think of the case of Kenya. Kenya um, has established a large number, something like 60, export processing zones. And so you would think from the title, export processing zones, that these zones would be located close to ports. Uh, on the contrary, most of them are located far away from ports, but they're still called export processing zones. Why? Because a lot of resources come to an area which is called an export processing zone, and Kenya's politicians have been very interested in getting these resources and therefore declaring an export processing zone within their constituency. And um, there hasn't been the discipline in the system as a whole to stop this. So um, I'm well aware that um, any of these industrial policy instruments, including export processing zones, but all the others, can be abused. Uh, but just as I'm well aware that laws against murder do not stop murders, but the fact that they don't stop murders doesn't mean that we have laws against murder. And in the same way, the fact that industrial policy instruments can be used corruptly doesn't mean that there is no case for trying to improve the way that they're designed so as to reduce the corruption associated with their use. So, um, yes, my general point is that I think that um, uh, there is a lot of scope for um, special economic zones um, to, to draw upon this mechanism proximity generates productivity. Um, in terms of the um, of, of how um, some sort of preference can be made for domestic producers, as in the case of the Industrial Development Bureau in Taiwan putting pressure on Philips to switch its sources of supply, um, a lot of this, especially today, would have to be kept um, below the radar. It would have to be um, kept below the radar in the way that Phillips, in, in this particular case that I described, all that was done well below the radar. Um, it wasn't that the Taiwan government was imposing local content requirements on Phillips, for example, or on other firms. Um, why? Because, as, and certainly today, local content requirements are constrained by the WTO, if, by rules. If a country uses local content requirements, it can be taken to the WTO dispute settlement mechanism. And so um, you have to do these things in a more subtle kind of way, rather than with a formal industrial policy um, instrument, which might bring down sanctions on your head, but therefore you also have to have relatively non-corrupt officials who are 
doing what the Taiwan Industrial Development Bureau uh, officials are doing. And then comes the question of how you get agencies to work, to use the discretion in a non-corrupt kind of way. Um, and that then leads to very interesting questions about institutional design, about employment contracts of public officials. I'm reminded of the case of Singapore. Singapore has a squeaky clean public sector. And one important reason is because public sector salaries are, set, are tied to private sector salaries such that there is very little difference between um, private sector salary, between public sector salaries and private sector salaries of equivalent level. So for example, the head of government departments in Singapore, the salary of the head is set in terms of the average uh, remuneration accruing to the top five people in the private sector who do work which is closest to that of the head of the government ministry. So if you take the health ministry in Singapore, for example, the salary of the head of the health ministry is determined by the average of the, most, of the five most highly paid doctors in Singapore. And as the private sector salaries go up, so the public sector salaries go up. The other side of that is that if anybody is even remotely um, charged or suspected even of corruption in Singapore, then the, the weight of the state comes down upon them like a ton of bricks and all kinds of sanctions are put upon them and their family. They are really disgraced and kind of <coughs> ostracized. And so everybody in the public sector knows, at least at the higher levels, that um, you, don't be, you don't act corruptly. And so that again, that institutional device of tying uh, higher level public salaries to private sector salaries, that could be introduced in Poland, for example, or anywhere else. Um, that is one way by which it's possible to create non-corrupt public agencies, which use the discretion in ways that benefit the whole society, that don't just benefit the officials. Um, and then finally on outsourcing. Um, there is always this debate about um, uh, whether industrial policy assistance should go to American firms or should go to firms producing in America. Um, uh, because, and this debate became quite acute as American firms began to outsource uh, many of their um, operations to China. So if, if the industrial policy assistance was given to the firms, then the US taxpayers' money was helping to support firms which were providing employment in China and not in the United States. And some people like Robert Reich, who won, argued that industrial policy assistance should be given to firms of any nationality that were producing within the United States. But the argument is complicated because um, it may be necessary for the survival, for the growth, for the innovation of a certain American firm that uh, low uh, value added activities are outsourced to somewhere else. That may be important for the flourishing of that American firm and its ability to provide higher level jobs within the United States. So the issue is, is certainly complicated. It's not a simple answer. But what is interesting right now, I think, is the movement towards insourcing. That is, American firms and other uh, Western European firms bringing uh, uh, activities back to the home country, in particular because wages in China, but also in Vietnam, are rising now um, very rapidly. And so that the labor cost advantage of outsourcing to China um, may be diminishing. Um, and another interesting thing that's happening in the world um, is that there is some evidence that China <coughs> itself is bringing home activity that it previously was placing in regional production chains in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, in, in Vietnam, in Malaysia, um, 
products that were being made in Chinese-dominated regional production chains uh, in Southeast Asia are being brought back and produced in factories that are moving out into Western China, taking advantage of much lower wages out in Western China than on the Eastern seaboard. And that is having, that is beginning to have really quite far-reaching effects on industry in Southeast Asia, which had become specialized in producing things for Chinese-dominated uh, value chains centered in China. Um, so that's another interesting thing that's happening in terms of the location of global production. Okay. Uh, that way, I'm afraid, at least time-wise, we arrived mm -hmm. at the end of today's lecture. Uh, I think uh, I'm close to suggesting that uh, following a famous chapter of John Robinson's book, of accumulation of capital, where she has a sub-chapter on conclusions, and she says the conclusions uh, will be drawn by readers themselves. <laughs> uh, I feel most grateful uh, for the opportunity that we had to, to, to listen to you, Robert. And I believe that in some ways uh, we are in Poland in this position of also needing to be low key in terms of advancing industrial policies. This is not something that is very fashionable among uh, economic policy makers. Uh, even nowadays, although the climate is slowly changing. But then, of course, we have those striped jackets, not only of the World Trade Organization, but also of the EU directives. Um, however, what is important is that first, we need to be selected. Second, the assistance that we provide should be conditional. Third, that we should have exit strategies. And then that the whole business is about improving our competitive position and that the industrial pol policy is not a substitute for social policy. Okay. Yeah. What we are after in this business is improving competitive position, and this will bring, hopefully with itself, more and better new jobs, mm -hmm. uh, rather than trying to uh, disperse among potentially or actually unemployed uh, benefits that, with the help of which we believe that the miners who lose their jobs or, or steel workers or whoever would use that money for becoming a small entrepreneurs themselves because more often than not this is not a successful industrial policy at all. This is a kind of social policy, yeah. more often than not politically motivated. Okay. What is the most important, however, and this is a sort also of a question that I thought I might have raised, is that what is, seems to be important in your presentation is that if this does not refer to endowment with natural resources, like, for instance, state intervention into development of wine industry in Chile. Mm -hmm. 
because you need to have soil and you need to to have the climate where you can you know grow grapes. Uh, in this country, the only type of, of, of wine that we produce is of is not wine but vodka, not of uh, grapes but of, of sugar, papers or whatever. But in manufacturing industry. I am inclined to believe that what is important is not that you pick winners. It's not perhaps that important whether it's chemical, machine building, or any other industry. What is important is that you are consistent, that you spend your resources for long enough periods to develop new technologies and that you build not those networks. Who is you when you say you? The government. government. The government, OK? The a government agency that provides support. Because after all, over that period of time of 15 up to 20 years, whatever is the chosen industry, if you concentrate the you are most likely to succeed. Mm -hmm. okay. So again, all this argument about picking winners, you cannot be wrong in picking winners if you are consistent. Uh, okay. But so here, it, this it, is... It's yes. the distinction between picking winners and making winners. Yes. Mm -hmm. What yes. you're talking about is making, making winners. winners. Mm -hmm. Yes. You, you select, mm -hmm. and if you are consistent mm -hmm. and develop mm -hmm. networks, most mm -hmm. you are most likely to succeed. Mm -hmm. This would be my impression, having heard you, your presentation. Right. I would be curious to, 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 to hear your comment on that. Mm -hmm. well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, and I, the husband work I know 
but then you always stress that the Russians will run to all of the views to draw policy. I have to be spoken to him about policy implications. It's just very hard to go He comes from a very conservative of economics tradition. Yeah, but... 